I closed the blinds and turned off my phone. The TV that was always on now sat lifeless in the corner. I hated the silence, but I had no choice. They'd already come knocking on my door once. They'd be coming back. Ignoring wouldn't be an option the second time. A Bristol County judge would make sure of it. I needed a cigarette. It was nostalgic, having to find a good place to sneak one. I was 16 when my father caught me in the basement. As if the rancid smog overhead wasn't evidence enough, I'd left a burn mark on a cushion trying to shuffle the butt away. He had me put that couch through its first cleaning in decades, and at the end, he looked at it proudly and said I'd done good. Then he threw it out. Camping in my narrow, cluttered pantry was far less comfortable, but its window hid behind the crown of a large tree, perfectly out of sight. I sat propped against my refrigerator, the cold door on my back a refreshing break from the dry summer air. There was a static setting in. It stuck to my arm as it flipped open the notepad in my lap. My chicken scratch illegible in the shaded overcast, the long list of names and addresses. There was another to cross out. My bracelet danced as I scratched the pen along the page. The blue, pink, and yellow beads a stark contrast to the dry blood still smeared on my fist. It wasn't my fault. I was sure it was him this time. I wiped the blood against my jeans and with it the memory. Hurrying a cigarette to my lips but stopping before I lit up. The bracelet I'd almost forgotten. I slid it off and rested it gently upon the windowsill. Police sirens wailing somewhere nearby. I was ready now. Katie hated when I smoked, ever since she was little. I used to stand out behind the shed on the weekend she was here, adding to the pile of butts I'd left back there. I wasn't discreet anymore. My poor, neglected yard was carelessly decorated in my vice. The little white sticks tangled in the overgrown grass where furniture lay in disarray from winds long before the ones currently swirling about. A light gust brushed past my limp hand, sending ash and smoke back inside. It seared the cuts on my knuckles. I considered reaching into the freezer for some ice, but was too lazy to dig through the stock of keto-friendly meals. I don't have it in me to throw them out, and the damn things have such a long shelf life. I had what I needed, anyway. Sweet, sweet nicotine. I gave a long draw and savored it. Then came the knocks on my front door. I knew it was a matter of time, but I had hoped for more. I was so angry with myself. The junkie's lead made more sense than the mailman's. Guy gets high and gets into his car. I bet that's what happened. It seemed so obvious. Another bang on the door had my mind running through the options. I could slip out the back door, run to Dad's. His house was empty and would give me at least one more day to cross names off my list. There was a Pontiac for sale up in Dover that matched what my niece said she saw. Jack! I was too late. I slid the bracelet back on my wrist as more knocking rang loud. The muffled voice calling for me. One more cigarette would have been nice before they hauled me off. Instead, I emerged from my hiding spot and marched past the many bags of clothes and toys I never donated, straight toward the handcuffs that were waiting for me on the front porch. I failed there, again. I opened the door. My brother was standing there with his phone to his ear, frantic as ever. I've been calling you. I scanned the street behind him. Phone's dead. Yeah, no shit. Was it dead last night too? We stood in momentary silence, the wind whistling around us. His hair stuck up in the back and his beard was thicker than mine now. Can I come in? He asked. I stepped aside, a rush of air followed behind him, pushing back as I sealed the door shut. One of Katie's jackets had blown off its hook. I put it back. I wasn't sure you were home. Danny called from the living room. I would have preferred somewhere away from the windows, but he'd already taken a seat on the couch. If I'd known he was coming, I would have cleaned up a bit. Long abandoned laundry lay upon chairs, pizza boxes stacked under the coffee table. A truck's in the garage, I said. This storm is supposed to get real bad. Last thing I need is a tree through my windshield. I dropped into the armchair across from him and saw him throw a cursory glance at my notepad on the table. How's Ella? I asked. She's hanging in there, worth thinking about a vacation, but money's tight, keeping her busy with soccer for now. Wish she'd stop playing so scared, though. Anytime the ball comes near her, she flinches. I was like that, too. Give it time. His eyes narrowed. This isn't nerves, Jack. 
She saw it happen. Might help if her uncle would show up, let her know he doesn't blame her. That was the problem. Maybe I did. She's the oldest. She should have known better than to tempt Katie the way she had. It's not easy keeping those thoughts to myself. It's why conversations with Danny were like opposing magnets, and why I was never around to catch a soccer game. I told you, you've got to give me more notice than the day before. I explained. I know, and I have. You said it was too much to notice, and you forgot, remember? I didn't like the way he was looking at me. My baby brother, arms crossed with an unwavering gaze. His tired eyes were sunken in from the weight of his own burdens, and yet they were more concerned for me. Pity for poor, pathetic Jack. I wanted to wipe it off his face. He'd deny it, of course. He's a white lie kind of guy. Spare hurt feelings if you can. But I knew what he was thinking. Years of detecting Dad's ire gave me a strong mental radar. Problem was, Danny had it too. He broke off with another peek at my hand. There was still evidence of dried blood. I'll get you a schedule, he said. Jules made magnets for all the parents. They're good people. I think you'd like them, and I could use the help. I don't know shit about soccer. He forced a smile, but the heat of his watchful eye had me at a simmer, and I was already an easy boil. Can't be worse than Dad chewing me out on the bench every night, I said. Danny paused. You need to go see him. Why? So he can tell me it was my fault? Because he doesn't have long, Jack. He looks like shit. He had a bit of our mother in his voice and in his face, at least from what I can remember. He went on. Look, you want to shut me out? Fine. The girls and I will be here when you're ready, but Dad won't be. And if you don't, is this what you came here for? Lecture me about family. I don't give you any grief for putting your girl's savings on horses, letting you live on my couch for a year. For what? So you can tell me how to live my life? I don't need your advice. So if that's all you got, you can get going now. The words hung in the air. I already wished I could take them back. Danny's eyes reverted to what I always knew them to be. Meek. Vulnerable. Longing. Like when he came home with a black eye his freshman year and dad ordered me to deal with it, preaching from his gospel of how to be a man. A man protects his family. I beat the shit out of the punk who'd hurt my brother, but this was different. No amount of brute force could fix this. What I needed to do was much simpler and much harder at the same time. Actually, there's something else. Danny begun. It was clear he was working out how he wanted to proceed. His sigh coated in hesitation. I... Got a call from my buddy Hector. He still works at his dad's shop. Some guy came in a little while ago looking for an estimate on his car. Said he was hoping to sell it. He stopped at the look on my face. A Pontiac? Not just that. He rubbed his hands together while I fidgeted with the bracelet, waiting for him to come out with it. The front bumper, he said. There's a big dent. My body tensed, a tingle ran down my arms, numbing the pain in my hand. Why the fuck are we sitting here? I asked. Call Hector back. He already arranged a meeting for us. Guy has no idea who we are. He thinks we're coming to look at the car. That it's the same one Dad drove when we were kids. Dad actually drove an old Chevy, and I'll never forget it. His lessons on how to drive manually made me wish I never got my license in the first place. The Pontiac man was going to wish the same. Okay, then what? I said. You think he's just going to invite us in for coffee and confess? Not everyone's as bad a host as you, Jack. He dodged the look I threw at him and checked his phone to see who was calling. We'll stay casual, he continued. Ask about the car and see what he says about the dent. If it seems like he's lying, we'll push the right way. He nudged toward my scarred hand. I was already envisioning myself holding the guy down and repeatedly punching his face. I could hear the sound of his skull cracking. And what if it's him? What do we do? Danny put on his bravest face. That's up to you. It was a bad idea. Danny wasn't cut out for something like this. Even as the words came out of his mouth, they felt forced. I invited him to join me on my first mission thinking his own daughter's struggles would embolden him. But he argued with me. Said I was being too reckless that the car wasn't enough of a match to the one Ella had described. I went without him and didn't show the same restraint. 
What time are we meeting? I asked, checking the clock out of habit. It had been stuck at 2.09 for months. I needed batteries for the remote. Danny let out another quick sigh. Sunday. Bullshit, let's go now. I can't. Jules and I are taking the girls up to their grandparents for the weekend. We'll go as soon as I get back, I promise. I'll call when I put the girls to bed. If I had that long, I hadn't just shouted Katie's name at the last guy. I made him repeat it. When the cops came back, they'll be asking questions they already know the answer to, and I won't waste my breath lying. I should have told Danny exactly what he was walking into, but he was wary enough as it was. If he knew, he'd probably call the whole thing off. I needed another cigarette. Fine, I said. Give me the address. I'll go myself. No, you won't. You're going to sit here, rot your damn lungs out, and wait for me to come back. Listen, you're right. You were there for me when no one else was, when I was throwing my damn life away. This is me returning the favor. He held his stare until his phone rang again. I gotta go. Julia's mother's expecting us for dinner. If I'm the reason we're late, you'll be going by yourself after all. It was striking how much he had grown in the last few years. All that debt, the gambling, rock bottom served him well. I wouldn't bet on the same for myself. I wasn't just at the bottom. I was digging a deeper hole. I conceded to Danny a weak nod and watched as he answered a third call and said he was on his way. When we hung up, I noticed he was lingering. What now? I wondered. Do you mind if I take a look? It's just Scarlet's growing faster than we can afford and now her bathing suit doesn't fit. She's all excited to swim this weekend. Weatherman says we're all swimming this weekend. He needed confirmation. Go ahead. I added. I hung back as Danny rummaged through the black trash bags piled up in the dining room. It was her sweater last time, the one she always wore. Not that it mattered. Whenever he took anything, it was like I lost another piece of her. I wouldn't admit that to him, or that I was suspicious of his money issues. It always starts small. A better brother would have pushed. Instead, I put the bracelet on the table and ripped another butt while I waited. Some of the beads were missing from when it got stuck in my sleeve and I'd run it through the wash. I would have replaced them with Katie's, but they never found it. Danny returned with more than expected. He had a bright pink bathing suit draped over his shoulder and several other shirts in his grasp. One immediately caught my eye, a heathered blue top with a sea lion across the chest. There were still stains at the bottom. He noticed my stare. Money's tight, huh? I said. He let out a dry chuckle. He knew what I was thinking. <laughs> Believe it or not, some people choose their families. I bit my tongue and ushered him out into a blinding gray afternoon. Rustling leaves dominated the air along with the scrapes of barrels swept down the street. Sunday night, he reminded me it was more of a threat. Yeah, tell the girls I said hi. Danny turned back, his face scrunched, his hair already ruffling. Tell them yourself. I closed the door and everything was silent. Katie's purple fleece dropped to the floor again. A pilled sleeve outstretched in my direction. I held it for a second before putting it back this time. I wasn't waiting until Sunday. Hector and his father did work on my car once, a few years back. I couldn't remember the name of the place, only that it was in Westfield somewhere. A quick internet search told me that town had eight auto bodies. Only one had Hector Sr. Green Street Auto was about half an hour out. I wasn't familiar with the area, but I'd traveled through a few weeks back. Some asshole had been weaving in and out of traffic on I-95. When I saw what he was driving, I skipped my exit and followed him onto I-90. We'd raced in the fast lane for a while, and there was a moment when I second-guessed myself. What were the chances this was the guy? The longer we drove, the more I thought about turning back. With the beads on my wrist flashed under the passing orange lights, pushing me onward. I tailed the Pontiac all the way to the outskirts and into an apartment complex tucked into the woods. It was a young kid, a teenager. The sagging jeans and the sideways hat were enough for me to hit him, but it was the stony look on his face that did it. This self-indulgent strut. It was gone in an instant, his hat exploding off his head when I tackled him to the pavement. I wanted him to fight back, but he kept asking what he had done. So I told him. He swore he'd just gotten his license and that it was his father's old car. When I said I wanted to talk to him, he said, Me too. His father had suffered a heart attack earlier this year, well before Katie. 
I threw him a hundred bucks and left him weeping. I couldn't dwell on it. There was another Pontiac in Topsfield. Hector's shop was closed when I arrived. From across the street, I could see staff tidying up in a mad dash to get out of there, their flags and signs swinging madly in the gale. All the time I'd had to come up with a plan, and I hadn't. I worried that if I spoke to Hector, he'd call Danny. I couldn't risk it, nor could I risk alarming any residents whose homes I was idling in front of. My truck was of the few on the block, occupying a spot for which I did not have a permit. An invader to those who would soon be home from work. I sweat beneath my windbreaker. I needed to make a move. As I unbuckled, an older gentleman emerged from the offices and hobbled into the lot. He couldn't have been much older than me, maybe fifty. A mechanic had followed him out, other mechanics nearby shooting them sideways glances. I watched the two men have what appeared to be a contentious conversation. Hands waving, arms crossed, the scale of their back and forth tipped heavily in the mechanic's favor. His lengthy explanations met with sharp replies. The older gentleman heard enough, stepping aside to make a phone call. He looked nervous. Before I could get a better look, a dog walker strolling past spooked me lower in my seat, staring at my car on the way by. When I came back up, the men in the lot had already vanished behind a row of cars. I feared this was a waste of time. I had no idea what I was doing or who I was looking for. Just a brown, dented Pontiac. It pulled out of the lot a few moments later, that older gentleman in the driver's seat. The pudgy scowl beneath his shiny, bald head imprinted in my mind. This was the guy. I shifted the gears but was halted this time by a police cruiser rolling by. How far would they be looking for me? They could run my plate. I'd never forgive myself if they took me in when I was this close. The Pontiac turned left at an intersection. Once the cruiser turned right, I cut off the car behind me and sped down the road. The lights, green to yellow to red, I couldn't miss it. I swerved hard across the intersection, bringing oncoming traffic to an abrupt stop. Their horns meant nothing to me. All I heard was the broken crank arm of Katie's bike sliding along the truck bed. When I double checked my rear view for the cruiser, I could feel Dad slap on the back of my head. Keep going. My target wasn't far ahead, only a few cars between us. I kept my eye on it, my sweaty shirt sticking to the seat, the beads glued to my wrist. The nerve this guy had touring through town in that thing, the mark of what he'd done out in the open for all to see. No wonder he was looking to get rid of it. I followed him a few more lights until the road split us into wavy hills and farmlands, patterned greens under a darkening vengeful sky, my rage incarnate. We had the road to ourselves out here, between towers of trees swinging in the storm, warning me to turn back, as if it were an option. The Pontiac turned down a dirt road and was swallowed up somewhere inside the thick green, past an ornate, wooden sign posted at the entrance. Welcome to Grant Far. I wouldn't be welcome soon. The crank arm in the back continued to rattle as I crept down the bumpy road. I bet he thought I'd never find him here. I couldn't wait to see the look on his face when he figured out who I was. I emerged from the trees to find a grand farmhouse at the head of distant plains, run down yet still pleasant in front of a grey backdrop, with lavender columns fixed inside pink railings of a wraparound porch. The paint, chipped and dirty, peach-colored flowers in the front garden clinging to life in a barn up the hill in a far worse shape, the Pontiac disappeared somewhere behind it. Didn't seem like anyone else was around just some cows and chickens. The crisp stillness, something I was all too familiar with. The path swung around the back of the barn where several other cars were junked along the edge of the hill. I parked beside a rusty old Buick and strode in with a wave, my eyes immediately drawn to a pink bike in the corner. If I believed in signs, I'd say this was one. The man turned from his workbench and looked startled, as though caught doing something he shouldn't. He had a shoebox in his hands and was in the middle of rummaging through it, tossing something concealed back into the box. From this close, I could see that he wasn't as old as I'd thought, but rather worn and weathered. His chubby cheeks sagged with nicks beneath the five o'clock shadow. He coughed and collected himself. <coughs> Can I help you? Sorry to wander in like this. I began affably. Hector told me you were looking to get rid of this car and gave me your information. Oh. His face scrunched, eyes unblinking. He put the box down beside a flower pot, some of those pinks and oranges sprouting out. 
His face was turning the same color. I thought we said Sunday. We did, but I had something come up at work that'll be keeping me out of town for a while. Figured I'd stop by before I left. Right, right. It's just now's not really a good time. I got to take care of some things around the farm before it gets too bad out there. Tell you what, why don't you come back tomorrow and we can talk about it. I'm heading out first thing in the morning. Ah, gotcha. It must be tough letting her go. She's a beauty. She's had some work done, but money's tight. Gotta make sacrifices, you know? He stood there with his arms crossed and kept shuffling in place like he was waiting for me to leave. I softened my tone. Look, I don't mean to bother you. I couldn't pass up the opportunity. I've been searching for this car for years. It looks exactly like the one my father used to drive. Name's Doug, by the way. He shook my hand. His eyes lingered a bit upon the scrapes and bruises. Ian, what do you do for work, Doug? I work oil fields. I said, Dad and Danny worked in oil. I stock engine oil in aisle five. I can see that. Not easy work, I bet. Not at all. Ian kept glancing out the barn over my shoulder. Well, don't suppose you'd like to take it out for a test drive. Like fate itself was on my side. Why kill him here when I could drive him out to the middle of these woods first? A little rain never hurt anybody, I said. Would it be alright if I take a look first? He gestured toward the car. I ran my hand along the side of it, brushing past the many stories it held. The scratches and marks from decades past. The driver's side handle creaked and there was some foggy rust on the edge of the mirror. 66? I asked as I continued inspecting. 67, GTO. It was strange, the way he said it, like answering a question in class. I reached the hood of the car and opened it up. Some rust in there as well, but it seemed fine. Ian flinched when I slammed it shut. How many miles? He thought about it and gave a bashful shrug. Sorry, I hardly ever drive it. He started rifling off some of the things he did know, but I'd stopped listening. The front bumper. I knelt down to touch it. There was a cavernous indent the size of a baseball. It made me burn, my teeth clenching the inside of my lips, my breathing picking up. It took everything in me to keep it tempered. It was an accident, Ian explained. I could feel him behind me. I thought I was in reverse, I hit a pole. Huh. The way he chuckled after he said it, I could have killed him right there. That pedal sat in my truck waiting for me, for him. I stood up and dusted myself off. It must have been a pretty big pull. He switched his tongue along the inside of his mouth, the sweat dripping down his bald head leaving streaks of dirt in its wake. Heavy wind against the side of the barn filled the brief gap. Say, why don't we get you out on the road before things get any worse? All this talk, you really got a feeler for yourself. Mind if I call my brother first? He's sorry he couldn't make it. I know he's got questions as well. Of course. Things outside were indeed worse. From up on the hill, I had a clear shot of the strength of the storm. The entirety of the surrounding forest slanted with wind. Rain soaked through a hole in the bottom of my shoe, giving an uncomfortable squish every other step. I reached in the bed of my truck for the usual scrap of metal. Sleek and blue. The pedal, heavy and jagged. The only part of her bike I kept. It always elicited the same memory. The very first time I rested her foot upon it. I swallowed my grief and instead saw flashes of what I'd been using it for. What I was going to do now. I held it firmly. The bracelet swinging along the edge of my wrist. Barely hanging on. I couldn't tell anymore if it was holding me back or guiding me forward. A distant pop stole my attention. Followed by three more. I hiked around the barn and saw the SUV parked outside the farmhouse and three children tailing their mother, each with groceries in hand. The youngest, a little girl with bright blonde hair, was crying behind her brothers, hiding from the rebuke her mother hurled back at her. She stopped to gaze up at me, trying to figure out who I was. For a moment, I lost myself, like I was waiting for reality to set in after waking up. I put down the crank arm before Ian stumbled out shielding his eyes from sweeping bouts of dirt. He tried waving to his daughter, but her mother yanked her onward. She tugged so hard, the girl dropped her bag, 
Cans and containers rolled off and picked up speed in the wind. They dashed to retrieve them. Know what? Why don't you stay for dinner? Ian said. Give us time to discuss getting you out of here in that Pontiac. Just do me a favor and don't say anything about it in front of my wife. I haven't quite filled her in yet. The black sky opened up and sprayed us with a fresh drizzle. We stood side by side and watched his family stumble into their home. His young daughter kept shooting us glances over her shoulder as she was dragged off. My mind furiously racing, I couldn't do this right now. I'd have to evade capture another night and come back tomorrow, before Danny had the chance to convince me otherwise. After all, Ian was a perfectly pleasant guy, a father. But the longer I gazed out at that little girl, the more enraged I became. I was a father too. He took that from me. Okay, I said. What's for dinner? On the surface, the grants were characters plucked out of a hearty sitcom. Helen, genial and radiant, exactly how I remember my own mother to have been before she left. The kids, Noah, Luke, and Zoe, respectful and well-mannered, far more harmonious than Danny and I ever were. Ian was a lucky man. I'd make sure his family wasn't around when I bashed his head in. The smell of garlic hit me when we walked in, reminding me of my grandmother's cooking. A sauce stewed on the stove beside the tub of boiling water. Helen was behind the center island, unpacking groceries and tasking her children to get started with the vegetables. Katie would never. She didn't want to eat her meals, but the Grant boys were quick to their mother's side, paying no mind to the screen door snapping shut behind me. Only little Zoe seemed to care, her teary face peeking from around the dining room table where a line of those pink flowers sat in the corner. Got room for two more? Ian announced. He hung our damn jackets on a hook above a row of bloated duffel bags. They were going somewhere. Everyone, this is Doug. He's going to ride out this storm with us. I greeted them with an awkward hello. It was strange knowing they were the ones who would later identify me to the police. Helen glanced between her husband and me, her smile stale. What brings you by, Doug? He asked. And Doug's here to look at the floor downstairs. Ian said. Helen shot him a look of reproof like Emily had when I swore I was sticking to Katie's diet. The two of them stood rigid while their children continued bustling around them. Noah, tall, lanky, thin mustache, peeling carrots while young Luke dumped the shavings into the trash. Zoe was still ducking behind the table, throwing me strange glances from around the corner. It didn't bother me. It was the kind of wariness to strangers I'd always instilled in Katie. Everything all right, Zoe? Ian asked, the half of her face that was peeking out disappeared behind the tablecloth. A swift chop of Helen's knife killed the serenity. She cried the entire time. She said, I couldn't get half the things we needed. What happened? She thinks you're not coming. Ian called his daughter over and got down to her level, brushing the hair out of her rosy face. Zoe, I told you, daddy has some work to do first, okay? I'm going to meet you guys there. You promise? He hesitated. I promise. He pulled her in for a kiss on the forehead. I looked away. Watching him console her, Ellen may as well have driven that knife into me instead. I surveyed their home and noticed how strangely bare it was, like they'd just moved in or been robbed. There were long stretches of wall without furniture, shelves lacking photos, and a smooth marble mantle entirely unadorned. The adjacent living room had only half a sectional, facing an empty TV stand. I spotted colored tokens where the TV should have been, sobriety chips. I had an idea what Ian might have been sneaking in the barn. It seemed Helen did too. How's the car coming along? He asked, cold, caustic. Ian looked at me first. Almost ready. Good, you should come with us in the morning then. You know I hate driving in the rain. He stopped with the knife and waited for his response. He was checking a text on his shitty, old flip phone, suddenly jolting and clearing his throat. Actually, I was thinking it might be better if you left tonight. Once the storm passes, skip all the traffic. I got the guys coming early tomorrow. It's going to be hectic here. For the floor, right? That's right. Shouldn't only take a couple days. He snorted. I'm sure something else will come up. The microwave behind her chirped. She flung the knife into the sink and turned her back to us. Noah and Luke stayed focused on the carrots, doing their best to ignore the obvious tension around them. It was clear from their faces that they couldn't, 
Ian flashed them a smile. Noah, make sure you get to that ice cream shop as soon as you can, yeah? Plenty of kids around that lake looking for jobs this summer. Luke, don't forget your summer reading books. The boys simply nodded, a familiar appeasement. My father's lectures had long been white noise to me. You get so tired of hearing you're a failure that you stop listening. But unlike my father, Ian frowned and let it go. He was mere inches away from his family, and yet the distance between them seemed so far. I reveled in it. The illusion unveiled. They didn't love him. They endured him. It made what I was doing much easier. Ian stifled a cough with a closed <clears throat> fist to his mouth. Okay, well, Doug and I are going to head downstairs to look at the floor. Let us know when dinner's ready, yeah? Helen withdrew without a word and started clearing the flower pots from the table. She summoned help from Zoe, who pouted and sluggishly obliged. Now there's Katie, I thought. I lost myself in a moment of reminiscence, watching Zoe struggle to carry them, the way Katie struggled to hold the plastic trays of her frozen meals. I sprung forward to give Zoe a hand. When she gasped and let go of the pot, a crisp shatter spreading shards all along the floor, her glossy green eyes glued to me like a ghost finally seen. Helen was furious. Zoe, how many times do I have to tell you? Two hands. A whimper turned into sobs and Zoe was off her little stomps following her down a hallway and out of sight. A painful mirroring of that last day. Helen apologized and dug into a closet for the broom while I gathered some of the larger pieces. It's okay, I said. I get it, my daughter isn't much older than she is. I didn't mean to say it in the present tense. I didn't mean to mention her at all. This isn't like her though, something's going on with her lately. Her words were dripping with indignation, a conspiracy theory unheeded. The source of the underlying hostility. Ian stared down at his feet, his hands on his hips. He looked pale. And I'm sure I did too. Because whether their daughter was going through something or not, I didn't know. I didn't care. It was my bracelet that had paralyzed her. She recognized it. And in doing so, recognized me. I'd been sneaking around this entire time believing I was a wolf in sheep's clothing. What if I was the sheep? The Grant's basement was fully finished and undoubtedly the nicest part of their home. There was a bar on the left and a seat of sofas on the right facing a large, flat-screen TV. Framed pictures of various athletes decorated the off-white walls, none more striking than the bright neon sign hanging above the pool table at the far end. A relaxing space, and yet I could hardly breathe. This was where Ian unwound after leaving Katie for dead. Though the crank arm was far out of reach, I had no problem cracking him with an eight ball instead. Vinyl. He grilled with a tap of his heel. Looks like wood, far more durable. It's nice. Not when it domes. There was a bulge in the center of the room. It creaked when we got near. Here, take a seat. Let's have a drink. He checked behind the bar, as though expecting someone to be there, and then fetched two glasses and a bottle of whiskey. More of those flower pots sat on the shelves between various types of liquor, of which there were plenty. I preferred a more prolonged and smoky poison to the burning fire in my throat, and it was clear when I took a shot. Not much of a drinker, huh? Ian laughed. <laughs> no, not really. Good for you. Eight months sober myself. Two glasses on the counter behind him told me otherwise. A thin line of whiskey still sat inside one. Ian poured me another, but I waved him off. You smoke? How about a cigar? That's more like it. I said, if we were stuck in respite, it may as well have been over a cigar. Ian downed the shot himself and slid the glass aside. Don't tell my wife about that either. He was unknowingly filling in pieces to the puzzle, and the picture it showed further fueled my rage. A relapsed drunk, barreling down Highland Avenue, hitting a child and panicking. I wanted to reach across the bar and wring my hands around his neck when he dug somewhere in front of him for a couple cigars. Padrone, 1926 series. My dad, God rest his soul, used to keep one in a box right next to the TV that he was saving it for when the Cubs won the World Series. It was getting harder to fake nice. And did he? No, died a year before they won. I smoked it for him. He cut them and handed me one. I'm sorry to hear that. It's all right. We had plenty to celebrate. What about you? You close with your old man? 
I paused said more than I needed to. More than I ever had to anyone. But in a way, it felt easier opening up to him about it. The soothing ear of a stranger, untainted by judgment or bias. I rolled the cigar between my fingers. My father was pretty hard on me growing up, I said. I don't think I was strong enough to handle it. Forty years old and I'm still not strong enough. Ain't easy being a dad. We do what we think is best. A man protects his family. That's what mine always said. Only thing I needed protection from was him. Ain't easy being a son either. My boys would tell you that. Ian said. Bet they'd come see you if you were dying. Its head snapped up. Ash fell upon the counter while he stood in the unease. What's stomping you? I don't want to see that any more than he wants to see me. A disapproving nod. Well, not that it's any of my business, but I spent all my life following my dad's compass thinking it was the only way to live. And for a while, it worked. Got the house, got married, had the boys. It all happened the way it was supposed to. And then, Zoe was born, and it was like I knew nothing. He took a deep inhale of his cigar and was staring off. His thoughts shifted. I come down here most nights when I can't sleep, put on a movie or something. Zoe would sneak out of bed and make her way down and let her stay for a little while. I wasn't always around very much. It was the only time I really got to see her, you know. But every time she'd fuss, just a little longer, just a little more. I can't say no to her. I'm sure you know what that's like. I gripped my cigar tightly as he held the lighter out for me. Without thinking, I took my bracelet off before taking the first puff. It was deliberate and conspicuous. Ian blinked and moved on. Anyway, we start getting calls from Zoe's school. She's falling asleep in class, talking back, stuff like that. So when her mother caught us down here one night, she practically grounded us both. <coughs> he coughed through his laughter and took a moment to recover. I told Zoe, no more. She's got to stay in bed. She fights with me about it. I raise my voice. She storms off. It was a big thing. Didn't stop her, though. Not my little girl. She'd crawl behind the bar here and just hide all night. She thinks she's getting away with it, but that damn floor lets me know when she's here. Now, I know it's not right. I know she needs her sleep. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't stay up all night waiting to hear that squeak. He exhaled the thick cloud of smoke, and with it, his harbored regret... I knew exactly how he felt. The only way I could get Katie to eat those goddamn keto meals her mother insisted upon was to take her out on her bike after dinner. She'd fly down the sidewalk, block by block, turning back with wide eyes as she waited for me to catch up. My inner voice nagged me the whole way, my father forever in my ear. This isn't safe. It wasn't until she'd had a seizure while riding that I finally listened to him. Like Ian, I put an end to the one thing I had with my daughter. And like Ian, I pretended not to notice her bike in a different position on the nights her Uncle Danny had to watch her so I could work late. I saw that he was calling and let it ring. What's up with that? Ian said with a nudge to the bar top. The colorful beads stood out upon the dark wood. I shuffled in my seat. I didn't want to talk about it, the only thing worse than talking about my father. But something about his story must have softened me. I wasn't sure I wanted that either. My daughter made it for me. You're a better man than I am, let me tell you. Damn near ripped these flowers out of their pots when I found them here. Glada something or other. Supposed to symbolize strength of character. Bad enough my wife loves that shit. Now Zoe's getting into it. The things we do. Do they know what you did? Just doing what mine didn't, though you might want to prepare yourself. I teased. Zoe had her eye on it earlier. I searched for a flicker of panic in his eyes, but saw only amusement. Huh. She knows better than to ask me to wear something like that. A playful pat on the shoulder, a chuckle, two pals having a good old time. I resisted the urge to smash the bottle over his head. Instead, I spun the beads. Why'd you take it off? He asked. Promise I wouldn't smoke when I wore it. Ian's curious face faded into a frown. He dug inside his pocket for a red chip and smacked it onto the bar. Guess they're just things, huh? Guess so. I sent a dense billow of smoke to the ceiling and together we sat stoic in the cloudy haze. The cigar lost its appeal. 
All I could taste were the reservations I'd been trying to suppress, that perhaps I had it backwards. As much as I had enjoyed witnessing Ian's family struggle while he was alive, what if his death made things worse? Would Noah miss his father's guidance, the same stern push I needed at his age, one that Luke would never have? Would Zoe grow up feeling permanently abandoned, looking for Ian at her recitals, her graduation, her wedding, the way Katie always looked for me? If I was going to do this, I needed to believe they were better off without him, and I needed to get us far, far away from here. My phone lit up again and broke our reverie. You can answer that, you know. It's nothing, I said. Just my brother checking in. Ian took a drag and rubbed his forehead with the knuckle of his thumb. I can't sell you guys that car. I'd be happy to offer my truck in the deal. She'll get you to that lake in any weather. I'm not going to the lake, Doug. He let it sink in. This man had everything I wanted. Everything I'd lost. Everything he'd taken from me. And he was abandoning it? What about your family? You saw what it was like. They're already gone. His voice trembled, the pain seeping through his shield of smoke. Coming down here in the middle of the night? I wasn't watching movies. I came down here to drink. Even after Helen kicked me out and took me back. That's why she's so sour about you being here, you know? Probably thinks you're one of my old drinking buddies, like I'm back at it or something. Are you? He glanced at me sideways. There's a sickness in me and it's only a matter of time before it takes me. Zoe never made me a bracelet, but coming down here all those nights, he was saving my life, and she don't even know it. Sooner or later, she's going to find out. They all will. What? That you're not who they think you are? He threw back another shot of whiskey with a wince and shudder, cheeks red, eyes welling, that I'm exactly who they think I am. It was a fear we shared, my brother, my nieces, my sick, dying father. I couldn't bear the looks on their faces, that furrow of pity and disappointment. All it did was remind me that I was an unforgivable failure, and though I wasn't running away, was shutting everybody out any different? It's the reason I've been hunting down the Pontiac owners for weeks, and why I was probably going to jail no matter what happened tonight. I had to kill this man. It was the only way to make things right. The only way I could ever face my family again. Ian looked at me now, the same way they always did. His brown eyes flashing me that same, somber stare. It really pissed me off. Why now? I asked. What made you decide to run away all of a sudden? I was daring him to confess, to tell me what really happened that day. But before he opened his mouth to speak... The door upstairs opened, Helen's frantic voice calling down. Is Zoe down there with you guys? Ian wiped his eyes. No, why? She's not in her room. I can't find her anywhere. Okay, be right up. He poured one last shot and held it in his shaking hand. They locked in a gaze. It begged him, taunted him even. He swiftly slammed it back onto the bar and got up. I grabbed my bracelet and followed. Some of the whiskey had splashed on it. She's not up there. Noah and Luke shook their heads from over the upstairs railing. Their mother tapped her heels in the doorway below, arms crossed. She's probably hiding, Ian assured her. Hiding from what? He tilted his head. Right, this is my fault, Helen said. They're just flowers. You didn't have to yell at her like that. Oh, but I do. I'm the only one who does anything. I don't mind being the bad cop, but it doesn't work if it's only me. An uncomfortable pause. Ian broke it with another series of coughs that he tried tempering with pounds to his chest. The whiskey in his breath filled the air. Were you drinking, Ian? He remained silent and still. I thought about selling him out, but didn't need to. Helen huffed in disgust and called up to her boys. Grab your things. We're leaving now. But we didn't eat yet. Luke, now. Noah ushered him away, a trail of his echoed complaints stymied behind the closed door. Helen was already walking away. Thought you didn't like driving in the rain, Ian said to her back. She whirled around. Safer out there than here. 
You couldn't wait one more night? This dinner was your idea. You asked for it. And I still want it, more than anything. Her body wanted to believe it, her head and shoulders hanging low, yearning for his touch, but her mind wouldn't allow it. Not some things, she whispered. We're done being second. Ian's eyes darted in disbelief as she vanished around the corner. I felt compelled to say something, the way everyone had for me when Emily left. Granted, the pain of our separation stretched over an extended period of time, prolonged but diluted. Helen left Ian with whiplash, the finality unfolding before him in an instant. We should check the barn, he said. He walked off. Despite his large frame, it felt like I was trailing a sad child. It wasn't as enjoyable as it should have been. Night had fallen and the storm was hitting its peak. The wind pushed us back as we trudged up the muddy hill, my windbreaker flapping beneath my arms. Ian stumbled and cursed his way up, so I grabbed hold of his arm. We pushed our way into the barn and shut the storm out behind us. Ian leaned against the Pontiac and <coughs> coughed so hard I thought he might collapse. You alright? I'm fine. Zoe, hun, are you in here? The wind slashed against the barn, jostling every creaking nail and panel. We were alone, the perfect opportunity for me to take him out. I wouldn't even need the saw on the bench or the bat in the corner. He was vulnerable in more ways than one, visibly flustered, a desperate peer inside the Pontiac, a second peak beside the workbench. She was gone, and he was completely defeated. I don't know what to do, he said. It was the most genuine he sounded all day. I could feel his worry bubbling inside of me, reigniting the anxiety I'd had when I noticed Katie was no longer pedaling in the driveway. When I stormed outside and didn't see her in the street, sprinting down Highland Avenue to find a panicked crowd encircling a little girl in a blue shirt, spotted with blood. What would Ian look like when they found him? I studied him as he rested against the workbench, pale and sticky, noticing that the little pink bike was no longer propped beside it. Her bike is gone. I told him. He checked and then looked at me curiously. Had I given myself away? He pushed himself upright and limped toward the Pontiac. Ready for that test drive? He said. Hope you know how to drive stick. He tossed me the keys and dove into the passenger seat. I lingered behind, awestruck. This Pontiac was all I'd thought about since Katie's been gone. The thing I saw when I stared up at my ceiling unable to sleep. And I was going to get behind the wheel. I was going to chase down Ian's daughter in the car that took mine away from me. Can't see shit out here. Things were bad enough without Ian screaming in my ear. Rain hit the hood like bullets and the wipers left dirty streaks along the windshield. The wheel fought to veer right and my numb hands were struggling to keep it steady. Each bump caused the beads to tickle against my wrist. So much for having work done, this car would have killed him before I did. I couldn't believe I was doing this. Danny never would have let it get this far. My father, on the other hand, would have killed Ian hours ago. His voice in my head was getting louder and more impatient. Stop wasting time. We drove a mile down the main road and turned back the other direction. The houses were sparse, each mailbox appearing at random until we broke out from the trees and found nothing but fields on either side, covered in darkness. I could hardly see beyond the headlights and mist. Ian fell silent, his gaze out the window, his pain tangible and suffocating. Your girl ever do anything like this? He asked. My chest tightened. Yeah. Zoe's stubborn, but she's never this reckless. I think she knows. Knows what? That I'm leaving. The pitter-patter on the hood seemed to fluctuate with our mood. Now a soothing rhythm of taps. Maybe he was right. I knew my mother was going to leave. Didn't make it any easier. Excited slaps upon my shoulder startled me. There she is. Up ahead, the shine of pink metal flickered in the headlights. Zoe wasn't pedaling along. She was fleeing. Her little legs pushed mechanically against the incline of the road and the surging winds blowing past. It almost knocked her over. She didn't bother looking back and continued to pick up speed in the off-road gravel. Fucking kid, pull up next to her, Ian said. 
My foot felt heavy on the accelerator, powerful. I never took my eye off Zoe. Even from where I sat behind a rain-splattered windshield, peering past misty high beams, I lost myself in her. The back of her blonde head, hair sloppy and soaked over her drenched shirt, tiny elbows wobbling with each stride, butt off the seat. She could have been her. I stepped harder on the gas. Whoa, careful now, Ian said. Yellow lines zipped past as we drew near. Doug, slow down. How fast was he driving that day? Did he even see her? My little girl? Perfect in every way? Left in the road like trash? Her bike twisted and warped beside scattered bits of plastic and metal? I wanted him to know that pain, to suffer the way I was, to see the shell of his angel fallen and lifeless. I flew 55 past a sign that read 40, Ian still shouting and grabbing, Zoe just ahead of me now. All I had to do was turn the wheel a little to the right. I felt Ian's hand clasped around my wrist, press the bracelet hard against my skin. I drove past her. The brakes screeched as I parked on the side of the road. The hell's the matter with you? Ian shouted. It was like dad's voice escaped my brain. I kept my hands on the wheel and stared ahead as the rain pedaled off the roof. I couldn't speak. A cry was trying to make its way out again. Ian slammed the door on his way out and rushed over to where Zoe sat waiting for him. From the rear view, I watched him pick her up off the bike and hold her in his arms. They rocked for a moment, the rainy wind at their backs. I wondered what he was saying in her ear, how he made the world slow down for her, the way I had when Katie rode into traffic in a disoriented stupor. When they pulled apart, Zoe nodded to her father and clung to him once more. This was all she wanted. The only thing she ever wanted. I wanted it too. Ian stuffed Zoe in back and stabbed his hand toward me. Keys. Rain was pounding against the ground behind him. His shoes sunken into the mud. The white noise of the storm disappeared when he closed the door again. Leaving me and Zoe in muggy silence when he fetched her bike. She was shivering in the back seat. If it had been me, my father would have left me out in the flood and forced me to walk back. A fair and fitting punishment. But Ian wasn't like my father, and neither was I. I writhed out of my jacket and leaned back to drape it over her. It wasn't very smart running off like that. You could have been seriously hurt. I'd forgotten how good it felt to parent. Ian fought the wind on his way back to the car, rolling the bike along and fumbling with the keys for the trunk. My hands were impatient seeking comfort in the other, my soggy skin still coarse and calloused. My fingers danced along my palm and reached for their usual blanket, but the bracelet was nowhere to be found, just an empty wrist. I shot up in a panic, searching my lap and the floor to see if it had broken but found nothing. A madman cursing to myself in a frenzy spinning back to the sound of crunching nylon in the back seat. Zoe's arm, pale and thin, was poking out from under the jacket holding the bracelet. It must have gotten caught in the sleeve again. I snatched it from her harder than I meant to. Thanks, I added hastily. She was so small inside my jacket, shivering and blue. Her little voice shook past chattering teeth. Please don't hurt my daddy. I jerked all the way around to face her, her green eyes piercing mine. She stayed staring, mouth agape. Ian's hurried return interrupted before I could press further. Holy shit, it's bad out there, he said. Here, let's go. He jabbed the keys into my chest and held on me a beat. I was still floored. How did she know? I let another pair of headlights zip by before setting back off into the storm. I could feel both of their attention on me. Zoe stared through the mirror, Ian's panic beside me. I'm sure he'd known some sort of reckoning would come one day. But why tell Zoe? Had it come out during one of their late night hangouts? Had he thrown back some shots in another admirable display of sobriety? My head spun like the broken shrubbery swirling all around us, my arms shaking like the signs and street lights. Why did Ian invite me to stay if he knew I was here to kill him? The screen door swung against the farmhouse, oscillating with the currents. It was pitch black the torrential downpour diminishing the lights in the windows. Helen stood atop the steps, anxiously awaiting our return. 
The boys already packed into the SUV. She wasn't bluffing. Wait here, Ian said to me. He ran Zoe to her mother, who took her by the hand and tried heading off. When Zoe resisted and broke free, she grabbed Ian's leg and held on tight, sparking another argument between her parents. Their muffled shouting charged between waving hands and shaking heads. They let themselves continue to soak under the cover of their porch. Zoe, get in the car, now. Helen yelled. Zoe wriggled free from her reaching hand. Ian tried a calmer approach, peeling her off and imploring her to go with her mother. But she wouldn't listen. Her messy, wet hair covering her face. She left him no choice. Ian had to get stern with her, the one thing he said he couldn't do. And exactly what I had done when Katie begged to join her cousin at the park. Where Katie folded, Zoe kept fighting and had to be dragged to the car by her father, who picked her up and forced her into the RAV4, closing the door on her sobbing face. Helen got in before he could get to her, leaving him to plead at her window, first for his wife and then back to Zoe, whose face was pressed against the glass, hands smacking, breath fogging. It's going to be okay, baby, Ian shouted. I'll see you in... The car peeled out the driveway and disappeared between the trees. Ian remained in a state of sulk, lowering his head and allowing the rain to wash over him. I knew that look, the realization that you were never going to see your child again. I couldn't let it stop me from going through with this. We were beyond contrition. This was happening. Ian got back in the Pontiac and directed me to park in the barn. I heard a crack in his voice and ignored that too. I didn't care about Noah or Luke or Zoe or their mother. I'd never see them again. When the court takes me out in my jumpsuit and shackles, I'll keep my head down and take solace in knowing that justice was served, in more ways than one. Danny and the girls, they'd wear the appropriate faces, but deep down, they'd be glad I did it. And before they hauled me off, Dad would hug me in the way Ian hugged Zoe for the last time. He wouldn't need to tell me he was proud, I'd know he was, if he lived long enough to see it. The little light above the barn door was my only bearing. We passed my truck and made refuge inside. You should move it in here. Ian said, not in his usual fatherly tone, more subdued. He got out and hit a switch on his workbench. Hanging tools had fallen, loose papers were strewn about, and the shoebox had tipped over, its contents lying in dirt from broken flower pots. Ian bent down to retrieve some things, the lights flickering upon him. A spotlight, my cue. I hustled for the truck bed where that piece of Katie's broken bike sat waiting in a puddle, and when I charged back into the barn, I found Ian digging through the shoebox. He had his phone to his ear and was cussing under his breath. He nearly dropped it when he heard my command. Hang up and turn the fuck around. He rotated slowly, face red, eyes focused, not dissimilar to how I braced Dad's wrath. The phone in his limp hand lit up, his call being returned. He put it down on the workbench where it vibrated beside the shoebox. I didn't know what was in there, but I didn't want him reaching for that either. I gripped the crank arm tighter and stepped closer, a deep rumble booming overhead. Ian's breaths were short, the little huffs whistling out his nose. I could tell he was searching for all the courage he could muster. He was going to need it. You going to hit me with that? He said. Tell me what happened that day, and maybe I won't. He threw up his hands. She came right out onto the street. Didn't even look. It was like she was asleep. Her seizures. It was possible. But I couldn't hold her condition accountable. It was him. It had to be him. Why'd you leave her there? Were you drunk? Ian scoffed. I haven't had a drink in eight months. I swung at the Pontiac side mirror. It came off with a crack and shatter. Tell me the truth. Or I swear to fucking God, your kids won't recognize you when I'm done. Leave my kids out of it, Ian said. This is between you and me. Is it because your daughter seems to know what's going on? A regretful shake of his head. I was talking to a friend about it downstairs. When I heard the floor that night, I thought Zoe was coming in. She was leaving. She heard the whole thing. <coughs> he tailed off into short, crisp coughs. I didn't wait for him to recover. If you knew who I was, why did you invite me to stay? Would you have left if I hadn't? 
The thunder was getting closer, more frequent. The lamp on the workbench fizzled with each clap, loose bolts and screws rattling together. Some fell over the edge from Ian's phone buzzing once again. It occurred to me that Helen may have decided to turn around, something I was not prepared to deal with, nor Ian, whose worried eyes darted between me and the phone. How did you know it was me? I wondered. The flaps on his cheeks shuddered. When he reached for the box again, I took another step closer. He held it steadily in front of him and then pulled out a bracelet identical to mine, flashing the same blue, pink, and yellow beads. It was Katie's. I'd searched everywhere for it. And here it was, stored away in an old shoebox like some innocuous memento, or a token of a memory once cherished, now long forgotten. Seeing it in Ian's hands made me seethe. You took her bracelet, you sick fuck? A loud crack of thunder shook the barn. Ian caressed the bracelet in his hand. Must have been going pretty fast that day. It was stuck to the grill. A searing flash of red overcame me, pulsing through my temples. I lunged forward and swung at his legs. He fell to the ground with a howl. No one would hear it over the storm. The way he struggled to pick himself up, panting and in pain, it was exactly how I imagined it to be. He jumped when I slammed the pedal against the workbench. His delay earned him a second swing, this time to the knee. He wailed in agony, so I screamed louder. Her name, a strike, is Katie. Another, you should have stopped. Again, you should have helped her. And again, Ian writhed in the dirt like a sloth, his bloody shirt untucked, belly hanging out. He moaned something I couldn't hear over the thumps of rain hitting the barn the thunder still rolling overhead. I leaned in close. Did you look back? When you drove away, did you even look to see what you had done? I grabbed him by what little hair he had left. Some of it pulled out in my grasp. Answer me. I saw. I saw. Didn't see you, though. A twitch ran down my neck. Something else took over me. All the humanity within me leaving my body. I shoved him aside and followed up with several more swings this time against the back of his head. He fell face first to the ground and made sounds I hadn't heard with any of the others. The side of his face was coated in more blood than I'd ever seen. His cries cut up into deep, guttural heaves, barely escaping a bloody gurgle. He tried crawling but gave up and sank to the floor, his soul seeping out of him with each wheezing breath. As I hovered above him, his limp arm attempting to reach out to me, I no longer saw the drunk who killed my daughter. I saw Katie herself, on the ground, gasping for air, begging for mercy, reaching for me, her bracelet lying in the dirt between us. I was panicking. I didn't feel better yet, and there wasn't much life left in him for me to take. I searched for the traces of Katie that still hung in the air like stars, her giddy-up laughter, untamed and infectious, her bright green eyes, wanting and warm, her hands, small but powerful gripping mine with as much protection as she sought for herself. These little stars were all I had, and they were fading. Hunting her killer was the only thing keeping them alive. What would be left of her once this was over? Ian hacked up whatever was in his chest and spit it out beside him. In his outstretched hand was a thin thread between holding on and letting go, daring to be tugged. He looked up at me from an eye nearly swollen shut and in them was something familiar. The same faraway look my father wore the last time I saw him. Tired, lethargic, ready to die. The likely reason Ian hadn't sent me away today. He'd already been planning a permanent escape. Maybe I was the perfect vehicle to get him there. An infuriating thought. It wasn't revenge if he welcomed it. He'd robbed me of my redemption, and without it there was nothing here for me. I huffed in place, a menacing silhouette towering over him, the crank arm slipping from my grasp. I could have fled. I could have left him to die exactly the way he had left my little girl, his body lying awkwardly in the glow of the lamp, bent and broken like her bike was. Outside, the storm had fizzled out. Distant lightning still lit up pockets of darkness far beyond, showing me the way home. There was nothing for me there either, just a pair of handcuffs. Do it, Jack. The use of my actual name was less jarring than how little he sounded like himself. 
his raspy whimper not much louder than the continuous buzz of his phone. I wasn't going to give him what he wanted. He needed to suffer in a way that hurt him more than my violence. Answer it, I said. Tell them what you did. Just fucking kill me, you coward. I'm not the coward. Ian, tell your daughter you're leaving her. His phone was relentless. Miss call after miss call. I'd snatched it up and was struck by the familiar number on the screen. My brothers. Why was Danny calling Ian? My fingers left behind traces of blood as I clicked through. Ian had called earlier that day while Danny was at my house, and again while picking up the Pontiac, and several other times in the days prior. It didn't make sense. Danny found out about him this morning. What the fuck is this? I asked. All I got back was the sound of Ian's labored breathing under streams of rainwater dripping from somewhere above. He struggled to prop himself against the workbench, so I helped him up by the collar of his shirt and took hot coughs to the face. Why have you been talking to my brother? He remained silent and stone-faced, more afraid now than when I was beating him to death. His puffed eyes cowered beneath their brow, unflinching. A look I hadn't seen since catching Katie down the block on her bike. He wanted to see the car. Ian said. I shoved him back against the drawers. At midnight on the 28th? He was searching for what to say. I had a better idea. You know what? Let's give him a call and find out. Wait, don't, please, Jack. I need the money. I clicked onto the recent calls. We were never buying the car, you stupid fuck. Not the car. Stop. Stop. He said if I did this. <coughs> he coughed down blood and continued gasping for air, halting me with a flailing wave of his hand. One of his fingers was pointing the wrong direction. If you did what? This. You being here. I stood idly in my spot, treading in confusion until a wave of clarity crashed upon me. He knew from the start. The conversation Zoe overheard in the basement. It was Ian and Danny, plotting the entire thing, scheming in the night. As stunned as I was, it was exactly the kind of thing Danny would do. In all his righteousness, consensual revenge. How could he walk into my house earlier and lie to my face the way he did? I'm sure he justified it as an act for my own protection. Dad's mantra forever haunting me. I could see it now. Danny telling Ian exactly what to say over a drink, the extra glass of whiskey on the countertop. He would have needed all the liquid courage he could get to go behind my back like this. He was never going to let me hurt Ian. He was babysitting, a failsafe to prevent me from doing exactly what I had done. Ian must have shit his pants when I showed up two days early without his bodyguard, so he stuck to the script, a dramatic reveal of the real killer. Epilepsy. A tragic accident for all involved. I was supposed to just let it go. Ian would return the bracelet and I would be healed. Manipulated closure. Fuck both of them. How much is he paying you? I asked, pacing back and forth. A chill shook through me despite the humid summer air. Please, Jack, I'll give you half. He doesn't have to know that you know. How much? Fifty. Thousand? Christ. More money for booze, right? To take care of my family. Ian cried. Yeah, you're doing a great job. The slight hit him harder than the metal. He slouched in defeat and didn't bother fighting when his phone sizzled in my hand again. I answered. Danny's voice chopped in and out of the static. Hello? He said. Ian, can you hear me? Is he still there? I'm still here. It took him a moment to figure it out. Jack? Words struggled to get past the lump in my throat. I feared something else might escape with them. Something I've long held in. Fifty thousand dollars, Danny? Fifty fucking thousand dollars, Danny? More static sloshed around my ear, along with my thumping pulse. It drowned out my brother's reply. I screamed anyway. How could you do this to me? How could you give anything to this piece of shit after what he did? He killed her, Danny. The service was failing. I couldn't make out a single word he was saying. His muffled cadence repeating the same line over and over. Once the static settled, his voice broke through. It's not him. 
Jack, it's not. The call ended. I let the phone fall to the ground. I thought I might fall with it. It's not him? In an instant, the room had shrunk. I looked down upon the beaten man before me, whose blood painted my body. Innocent blood. Fractured bits of glass and plastic crunched under my feet. From a car he knew nothing about. Because it wasn't his. Hector. Green Street Auto. I didn't want to believe it. This was the one. This was the guy who ruined my life. But it wasn't. It was just a father, fallen from grace by his own hand, dragging his family down with him, desperate to atone for tearing them apart, but too afraid to do so. Instead, spending his time fixing everything around the house while those living inside it remained broken. My brother offered him green salvation, provided the car, the information. All Ian had to do was pretend to be a murderer. I was dizzy. Why? Why would you let me do this? I said. The lacerations on his head spilled along his nose. You know why. I thought back to our conversation in the bar. Everything he'd said now cast in a very different light. And in its shadow, he wept. His sobbing whimpers that would have once been music to my ears now shrill and uncomfortable. I got down to his level. A father once more. Teaching his child a valuable lesson. You didn't have to do this, I said. All they want is you. They don't even know who I am. I missed everything. In the times I was there, I don't remember. Bloody tears streamed down his cheeks. Will they remember me? I was afraid of the answer. Of what story Zoe would tell her future spouse. Would she have any to share? Or would she cling to their fragments of joy? the way I clung to mine. Someday, when my nieces Scarlet and Ella asked for stories about their cousin Katie, will I remember the time she called 911 because we were out of syrup? Or when she carried around that worm while trick-or-treating? The name she'd given it had already escaped me. It was as gone as she was. My wife, Ian, still had them. His weren't lost yet. He'd built a wall between them to hide behind. They were right there on the other side waiting for him. I took his head in my hands, and his eyes rolled back. You want to make things right? I said. Quit drinking. Call your doctor, your therapist, your sponsor, whoever the fuck you gotta call, and figure out what you need to do. Ian was fading, so I spoke louder. And then join your family at the fucking lake house, because one more day with them is worth more than whatever my brother was going to pay you. His head hung low. Too heavy to tilt, the swelling of his face a monstrous deformation. I'm dying, Jack. You're gonna be fine, I said. I wasn't convinced. I fetched his phone to dial 911 and tossed it to him as it rang. Go see your kids. The dispatcher's voice called out from his lap. Ian ignored it and used his last bit of strength to hold something up for me. Katie's bracelet. The smoking gun. It came from Danny. He must have found it lodged in a sleeve from one of the many sweaters he'd taken. Or perhaps Ella did, just as Zoe had in the car. I'd tried taking it, but Ian pulled back, my knees buckling under the weight of everything that had happened. I'll go, if you go, he said. We held for one last look, his dying eyes firmly fixed on me. I refused to acknowledge what he'd said. I gave one good tug and the bracelet was mine. It slid perfectly down to its twin, the closest I felt to Katie's hand in mine in a long while. She walked with me to my truck and held on tight as I finally got the hell out of there. I changed into a dirty work shirt and threw the other out the window. Evidence for later, though I doubted anyone would notice. Fallout from the storm littered the empty roads. Leaves and branches floating in deep puddles, blinking streetlights calling for help, and lawn furniture sitting dangerously across both lanes far from home. Didn't slow me down. I still had more leads, assuming the police hadn't taken the list into evidence by now. I planned to swing by Methadone Mile to find that junkie. He'd sworn one of his dealers drove the car I was looking for. 
Stewing over a new prospect was normally an adrenaline boost, but not this time. I couldn't stop thinking about something Ian had said. You know why. He was willing to die rather than live without his family. A notion I didn't want to understand, but with each passing light exposing the blood on my hands, I thought about how easily they could have turned the wheel toward an oncoming semi. It wasn't the first time it crossed my mind. The phone vibrated in the cup holder at exactly 9 o'clock. I knew it wouldn't be long before Danny called, but the ruminative drive with the windows down did little to allay my anger. I got nothing to say to you. I spat. That's okay. Hope everything went all right. In the background, Julia hushed my nieces and told them Daddy was on the phone. He couldn't say it, but he wanted to know if I killed Ian. Your pal's fine, I said. Where'd you meet him? Your bookie? A low blow, one that must have stung. He let the brooding silence sit for a second. Listen, Jack, you need to meet us at St. Mary's right now. No, you listen to me. I don't need to do shit. You lied to my fucking face. As I crossed the line from Westfield to Dartmouth, the pavement beneath me got smoother. The bumpy rattles now a deep, soothing rush of white noise. I heard a quiver in my brother's voice that I couldn't before. It burst through his words like hiccups. The doctor called. He said, They don't think Dad will survive the night. Something heavy leveled my chest, smothering, like the neighborhood around me. Porch lights and decorations for the 4th of July reflected along my windshield. Flickers in living room windows where families were ending their nights together. Small signs of life. And yet I felt like I was the only person left on earth. Please, Jack. I need you. I can't. I hung up. The leather of the steering wheel peeled from my hand as I reached to wipe the tears away. Small bits of emotion slipping through the cracks. Eyes darting. Breaths short my mind waiting for a safer reality to hit me, as though I'd simply woken from a nightmare. I knew this was coming. Danny had even given me an urgent reminder earlier, one that I brushed off. Now that it was happening, it was the only thing I cared about. I stepped harder on the gas and ignored my phone in the passenger seat. There was a stretch of road between Dartmouth and Vermont, with varying speed limits, switching from 40 to 25 to 35. I blew past it, going 60 and merged onto the highway as recklessly as when Dad first took me out onto the interstate. The angry horns had said enough. I didn't need to hear one of his lectures, and if I didn't get to the hospital in time, I never would again. It wasn't long before the Boston skyline appeared, illuminating the distant fog. Pockets of traffic materialized the closer I got. I weaved through it with no regard, pushing 90 down the open lanes beneath an overpass. I didn't notice the cruiser hiding until it turned on its lights. My stomach sinking at the flash of blue, I couldn't pull over. One quick run of my license and they'd take me in. I accelerated faster. The bright orange bulb was above whizzing past. It finally sank in that this was it. It's over now. Everything I had been running from seemed so far away now that I yearned for it. With the trouble I'd left in my wake right on my tail. I cut across several lanes and turned hard over an exit, almost venturing onto the grass. Dad's voice in my head told me to stop and do the right thing. I ignored it. I ran the light at the end of the off-ramp and turned down an empty street. More cover would have been nice, but it appeared the storm sheltered most people in for the night. I didn't know where I was, somewhere near Grandland or Stockton. St. Mary's wasn't far. The back road to Route 60 would get me there. Just had to pray that Staddy didn't catch up to me first. I let more of Danny's calls go unanswered, with sirens not far behind me. I couldn't afford the distraction. Would the next time we spoke be behind bars? Would he even visit? As badly as I wanted to kick his ass, I'd already forgiven him. Or maybe the flashing lights in my rear view softened me. There was more than one set. The sign for Route 60 clung to its crooked pole as though someone had hit it with their car, probably as fast as I was currently driving. Visions of Katie spilled into every crosswalk. My hands gripped the wheel as tightly as they'd gripped her handlebars that day she seized into the street. The first time I realized my father was right, about everything. Another symphony of sirens shot me back into the moment, 
I couldn't tell where they were coming from or where I should go, my heel trembling upon the brake at a four-way stop. One wrong turn and I was done. The chance of seeing my father again hanging on every move. The car behind me honked, adding to the chaos. Two fire trucks and an ambulance whipped around the corner and flew past. I was close. I retraced their path and spotted a glowing sky amid the darkness. St. Mary's lights a little further down the road. I followed them and pulled into the lot, parking crooked into the closest available spot to the ER. A quick check of my phone, a message from Danny saying he'd be here in 15, I had to go now. The few heads in the emergency room paid no mind to my frantic arrival. An older woman was already speaking to the receptionist, so I waited with crossed arms and did little to hide the rush I was in. I kept glancing over my shoulder and caught eyes with one of the men waiting in the lobby. He was sitting in the same chair I had sat in when they told me Katie was gone. A faint glimmer of blue shined through the windows and ran along his face, two cruisers pulling into view by the automatic doors. I took off, the young receptionist calling after me. I slipped into a stairwell and skipped up the stairs as fast as I could. I was hazy on the room, but I knew the floor. If I could make it there, three levels up and I was already out of breath. I had to push on. I couldn't let my father's last experience be another one of my failures. My entrance into the sixth floor was much too boisterous. I'd shoved the door to the wall, a major disturbance among the steady humming and beeping of machinery. Nurses huddled at the far end of the hall, gazed my way with worry. I'm here for my dad, I declared, as though it was some spell to do whatever I wanted. William Holloway, what room is he in? One of the nurses started marching over to me. I didn't have time to wait for her. I kept moving down the vaguely familiar wing. Sir, you need to sign in, the nurse called. I was already checking the rooms, 603. A woman flat on her bed, her tired eyes stuck awake. Sir, the nurse tried again. Just tell me what room he's in, William Holloway. Sir, I'd be happy to do that for you if you checked in at the desk first. The door to 605 was shut. I peeked in and startled the man inside. The nurse continued pursuing me and instructed the others to page the doctor. I moved faster. 606 was empty, but when I got to 607, my heart stopped. I wasn't prepared to see him that way. It had only been weeks since I'd visited last. Yet the difference in his condition was unsettling. A corpse clinging to life, more dead than alive, surrounded by machines and tubes. His eyes were closed. Two troopers burst through the doors down the hall, guns drawn. I threw myself into the room and looked around in a panic. There wasn't much. I spun my father's bed and used my whole body to push it in front of the door. Even with the wheels locked, it wouldn't hold for long. There was already commotion on the other side my father unresponsive to the noise. I took his limp hand but felt no reciprocation. It was like holding a doll. For the first time in a while, I started crying. A real cry. All my pent-up emotion finally made its way out. Danny. Dad. Dad, it's me. It's Jack. His fingers gained life and gave mine a small squeeze. He could hardly keep one eye open. He looked me up and down and turned to the banging behind us, officers demanding I let them in. What did you do? Dad asked. I was sobbing. I fucked up. I tried to make it right. I tried. I'm sorry. He dropped his head. For a moment I feared he had died right there in front of me. When he opened his eyes again, they were full of the same disappointment I'd long grown accustomed to, which was almost worse. Oh, Jack, he whispered. Oh, I'm so sorry. The troopers threw their shoulders into the door. The bed was slipping away from me, and with it, my father. He kept repeating his apologies, the guilt growing with each slam upon the door. He reached for my face but didn't have the strength to get there. You know I love you, right, Jack? I couldn't see through my tears. <laughs> I know, Dad. I said, but I hadn't. Not until that moment. I put his withered hand to my cheek and held it there. He then uttered the last words I'd ever hear him say. She knew too, Jack. A warmth spread throughout my body. One I'd never felt before. 
I wanted to stay in it forever. With the door open just enough for one of the troopers to slide through, he ordered me to the ground and threw me down anyway, pressing his knee hard into my back while the other put me in cuffs. The floor was cool against my face. Vinyl, like Ian's basement. They read my rights and informed me of the warrant out for my arrest. An assault on one Gerald Cooper, the one before Ian. My father peered down in a panic, his outstretched arm still reaching for me. A splash of vibrant color stood out behind his pale skin. A flower pot on the counter, green stems standing stiff, their bright petals pink and orange. Gladioli, a gift of strength for someone who needed it, from someone who was fighting the same battle. Ian wasn't my brother's friend. He was my father's. They'd met during treatment. The final piece to the puzzle. Cancer. Ian was a dead man long before I showed up. Running away? His break from sobriety? Actions of a man whose days were numbered and doomed to suffering. I wondered why he hadn't told me. He couldn't have presented me with better karmic justice than that. A deserved decay. One that might have saved him from the beginning. But I suppose that was the original plan, wasn't it? The real reason he didn't care if I killed him. Why he needed the money so badly. He wasn't choosing to leave his family. He was being taken from them. He wanted to provide for them without them knowing the truth. He didn't want them to see his deterioration, nor did he want their undeserved pity. Something I understood very well. And for our shared suffering, I paid him with more. Parts of my body were still dotted in his blood. I felt sick, and it only got worse. The troopers picked me up and dragged me out before I could give my father a proper goodbye. I love you too, Dad. Okay? I'll come back. I'll see you soon. We were already out the door. As they hauled me off, I begged for one more minute with my father continuing to shout over my shoulder for him. If he replied, I couldn't hear it. Only the brisk stomps of the troopers' steps and the frantic chattering of nurses standing by. Tell them, I begged. Tell them how sick he is. I need to be with him. They gawked at me like the lunatic I knew I was. All the days I'd wasted hunting someone I was never going to find, punishing innocent people for driving a car I wasn't even certain was responsible. I should have been here instead. What I would give to exchange every swing of that crank arm for another day. My cries echoed throughout the stairwell and followed us into the lobby. Danny and the girls were waiting. Their faces dropped when we walked past. My niece's nervous gas breaking my heart even further. Danny rushed over and was asked to step back as we spilled out into the lot. Other onlookers appeared like moths of the blue light, local PD arriving on scene as well. One of the troopers pulled them aside, where they each took turns shooting me stern glances. I was more concerned about the little redhead cowering behind my brother, watching me get frisked against the back of the cruiser. Look at all these lights, huh, Ellie? I said. Her mother came and backed her up. Danny was wide-eyed. Where's he going? He asked the trooper. So, folk, can I talk to him first? Just stand back, sir. The trooper stuffed me in the back of his cruiser and joined the others, leaving Danny dumbfounded. I couldn't remember the last time my little brother looked so little, like he actually needed me. It's okay. I called out the barred window. Go see Dad. I'll be all right. Danny sucked in his lower lip. Eyes red. You're going to prison. He was right. I hit Gerald Cooper so hard his teeth came out. I hoped the four other men were more forgiving, or that my situation would garner leniency. If not, I was looking at a hefty sentence. It was what I deserved. Not Danny. He deserved better. So much better. Think Ellie will still be playing soccer in 15 years? I cracked. He wasn't in the mood. I'm sorry. I tried saving you from this. I thought I could help. You can post my bail. Don't say you don't have the money. The gathering of law enforcement dispersed and returned to their vehicles. The trooper was ready to take me away. He hopped in and said something into his radio, clicking away on his laptop as he spoke with dispatch. There's a man in Westfield you should check on. I blurted. His name is Ian Grant. Yup, they got him. Is he alright? He didn't respond. 
He kept his attention on the computer screen and carried on with the back and forth on his radio. Out the window I saw Danny and the girls huddled together. It crippled me. If this was anything at all like how Ian had felt today, then there was nothing I could have done to hurt him any worse. In fact, much of what he had said was genuine. The struggles of being a father and of losing one. I really hoped he was okay. The other cruisers started rolling out. The worry in my niece's eyes put my stomach in knots. I had obsessed over Katie for so long, I forgot I still had anyone else to care about. And now that I was being taken away from them, they were all I wanted. I shuffled around the cramped space for a better look. The cuffs a bit tight on my wrist. The bracelets pushed too far up my arm. Wait, sir, I need to give them something. I cried. They can get it at the courthouse. No, please, it's for my nieces. He turned his lights off in motion for the other trooper to pass. Are you a father? I asked. My daughter, she was killed. That's what all this is about. Please, sir, my niece was there when it happened. Let me give her my daughter's bracelet. A quick glance in the rearview mirror. A sigh. He muttered something into his radio and hopped out with Pep, meeting me on the other side. Danny and the girl were still standing there, confused. Take both, I said, to the little one, too. The trooper leaned me forward to remove a cuff. I didn't care that he put it back tighter than it was before. A great weight within me lifted when he walked the bracelets to Scarlet and Ellie. Their mother was hesitant to take them. It'll keep you safe, Ellie, I shouted. Go score some goals. You too, Scar. Their faces were blank. Danny thanked the trooper, who gave a swift nod and got back into the cruiser, bemused and ready to go. I pressed my face to the bars and continued calling out to them as we drove off for good. They looked lost. It wasn't often that a brother or uncle's arrest was the second most overwhelming part of someone's day. A terrible palate cleanser. Dad was still up in his hospital room dying. The added pain I caused them hurt me more than anything their sulking shuffling to the hospital could. But as the cruiser pulled me out of the lot and around the ascending bend, I caught a glimpse of Ellie turning back with a wave, Katie's bracelet dancing upon her wrist. I never felt more foolish. I should have been heading in there with them, mourning, grieving, healing, sending my father off the right way. Instead, I was locked away in this box, alone, taunted by the mere margin between us. They were right there. They always were. I hoped they would be when I got out.